Thank you. Now, I urge you to wear good masks when you're in yours with anybody, except if you can live with, you know, if you don't mask with each other, that's okay. It's not that you're protecting yourselves together. Uh, I don't want any of you to become permanently harmed by COVID. The chance, a small chance, but not minuscule, that you'll get long COVID. You have, you have brain fog for the rest of your life, fatigue all the time for the rest of your life. And that would be a shame. I don't want that to happen to me. And I was taking precautions about that. But now you can see that um, I've gone through somewhat of a change. I don't hear you. Is the mic not working? Oh, I see. It has to be too close to me. Okay. I hope you will wear masks to protect yourselves from catching COVID because there's a certain chance you'll get long COVID, you can have brain fog for the rest of your life, you can have fatigue all the time for the rest of your life. That would be my original reason for protecting myself carefully from COVID. I don't want those things to happen to me because I want to do some things. I want to be able to capable of doing things that I can contribute. And long COVID could make that impossible. It could do it to you too. That would be a shame too. But I have a worse problem now. I have cancer. It's a kind of lymphoma. Fortunately, it's, it can be managed and I'll probably be around, be around for many more years. So it hasn't made a fundamental change in my life. I'm still working for free software and other causes I support separately. And uh, still involved in uh, carrying the GNU project forward. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, that's why I don't have much hair anymore. But other than that, I basically look the same. <laughs> when you get to see me with the mask on, which I do outside, much safer there. So, <clears throat> there were some jokes I wanted to tell about this, but most of them are gone. But I do have this port. They put this port in here so they can stick needles in the air. But there's a problem. No ships are coming. No ships have got to this port since I first had it put in. Now, I thought I would get some commerce from this port, and it would help me pay for these treatments I'm getting. But it turns out what they put in is a one room at the port. It's so dim that see captains can't see that it's there. So I'm going to demand a 10,000 lumen basically uh, license to buy ships to dock at my port. Anyway, so one of the issues that the free software world faces is the rather nasty Red Hat support contract. I don't see that there is a basis to sue Red Hat for, the, for you know, does it violate the new general public license? It's, I don't have a conclusive answer to that, but uh, what's clear is that it's anti-social. Specifically, to tell people they'll be punished with or could be punished, they're, 
extra support contract might be canceled or might not be. Morally speaking, there's no difference between that and saying it will be canceled. It's just making the situation more veiled between an behind an irrelevancy. Effectively, they're threatening to cancel support contracts for users that who do what they're supposed to be able to do, which is to redistribute the free software they're getting from Red Hat. And this Red Hat should stop. Now, there's a separate aspect, which is to get support customers have to pay based on how many users you're getting the support, how many machines the support is for. That's a secondary issue. I don't think that that is particularly harmful. The crucial harmful thing is, to try to, is that they're trying to stop users from redistributing GNU software, other free software, since sharing redistribution is what it's for. So, I hope that the community's influence will put it, will make Red Hat change that aspect of those contracts. We've been hearing a lot about artificial intelligence, and that term carries a terrible confusion, because in addition to, oh, because I, as I see it, intelligence in terms of means something's ability to know or understand some area. If something can't actually understand things, we shouldn't say it's intelligent. Not even a little intelligent. But people were using the term artificial intelligence for bullshit generators. I, it, it's not, I don't understand, what's happening? I'm holding it here, does it sometimes work and sometimes not? What's happening? You gotta hold it near your mouth. Oh, well that's not usually a good thing to do, but okay. The thing is, I don't notice when it stops. It sounds the same to me. How, what? I don't know. How long did people not actually hear me? I think we, we hear you. But not as well as well. Oh. So you don't have to repeat. Okay. People agree I don't have to repeat? Yeah. So, people were talking about systems like chat GPT, which doesn't understand anything and doesn't know anything. These, that's why I call these systems bullshit generators. Because the only thing that they're good at is making smooth sounding output, any part of which could be bullshit. You can't believe it ever. Well, you're dumb if you do. So I don't want to call those artificial intelligence or anything with the word intelligence in it. Because calling it that, calling them that, encourages people to think that what they're saying is not bullshit. It encourages people to believe, and that gives them the chance to do great harm. So I distinguish those two areas. There is real artificial intelligence. For instance, there are programs that can look at a, a photo of some, magnified photo of some cells, and tell you with greater likelihood of being right than any human doctor, whether it's cancerous. Or, for instance, there are artificial intelligence systems that can figure out what's going to attract people's attention very, very effectively. And these are used by anti-social media platforms and sad to say, they work very well. They're very good at what they do. And what they do is getting users or users addicted. It's a plague on society. And this is an illustration of something that AI can do. 
which we should not permit it to be used for. It should be illegal to run systems, whether they're artificial intelligence or not, however, whether there's machine learning or not, however, regardless of how they work, it should be illegal to operate systems to recommend to users things that are likely to make them get more engaged in the system in question because that's addicting people and we now know that the effects of that on society are terrible. They're disastrous. They include suicide. But we have to realize that if, we, if there are things we don't want programs to be used for, the way to achieve this is by making it illegal to use programs to do that. Software licenses are not the right way to prevent a program from being used, from being used harmfully. That's not what software licenses are effective for. They're not powerful enough to achieve that goal. And meanwhile, because they're chosen by private entities, it's undemocratic for the choices to be made by those private entities. It's legitimate for a democratic country to pass a law saying you can't run a platform designed to maximize users' engagement. But it's not legitimate for someone who wrote a program and published it to put on it a license with that same condition. Because private entities shouldn't have this kind of power over other entities, over people. Over people, how long has this been? This is a real thing on the net. Does this, does this have a low battery? Because I've, I've heard things like this happen when a microphone has a low battery. Is there another microphone? No, because you're making it... You, what? You're slowly dropping it as you... Yeah, of course, but I I don't generally find that mics need to be this held this close to the mouth unless there's a weak battery. Is that what's happening? The point is, I'm going to forget it again and again. It's, it's no use hoping I won't. That's not a solution. We can suffer having this happen over and over. I'll do my best. But you know what my best is. It's not going to be better after now than it's been the past few minutes. I'm sorry, but that is beyond the change. Well, in any case, so the point is, people who are trying to solve the dangers of real artificial intelligence by software licenses that restrict what people can do with the program when they get it, they're barking up the wrong tree. It's an ineffective, unreliable solution, and it's also an injustice because it denies people the freedom that every program ought to give them. Now, this is not the first time we've seen people try to do this. There are various software licenses that people have published that restrict what a program can be used for. And they've always been wrong. There is a, there's a page in gnu.org slash philosophy called uh, Why Software Licenses Must Not Restrict the Freedom to Run. I think that's what it's called but you can find it. The situation is unchanged. The real problems of AI, the harmful uses, uses like deep fakes, they should be prohibited by law and individuals should not make these laws. Democratic governments should. Now, in regard to bullshit generators, well, what should we do about that? If there are, clearly, if something needs, can be done, 
it should be done by laws passed democratically and not software licenses. Well, what can actually be done? Well, one thing is perhaps a labeling requirement, publishing any output made by a bullshit generator, even partly by a bullshit generator, should have to have a, uh, a label saying, this was generated by a language model, don't believe anything it says is true. Do you agree? Microphone. Oh, how much do people not hear this time? Okay, good. So, uh, so the point is, that might help. And uh, in general, not going at artificial intelligence, not, suppose, not supporting the belief that they're anything but gobbledygook, uh, expect expecting to find errors in whatever they said, this will help society become somewhat resistant to the harm that they can get. <clears throat> now, one of the condun conundrums we face in our community is how do we get young people interested in free software? Now, children sometimes can get interested in free software. I'm afraid that there is a problem that happens once the calamity of peer pressure sets in. Now, I was safe from peer pressure. I was completely out of uh, popularity, I gave up on trying to be popular. I just said, this is a, it's a waste of time for me to do anything trying to be popular, so I won't bother. And so I was safe. And there's some others who are safe. Maybe we can find them and interest them in free software so that they can find a community of people that is not so superficially focused on imitating everybody before everybody uh, else imitates each other. Maybe. But we can also look at the anti-social media platforms that exacerbate this effect. Uh, the platforms on which people are trying to compete with each other to do stupid things and look at the other terrible effects that they have, which include causing uh, psychological illnesses, suicide, lunacy, terrible suspicion of each other. It's, again, I don't have children, but I, and I don't work with children, but I read about these things, and they sound pretty damn horrible. Maybe if we prohibit operating recommendation engines that are designed to encourage people to be more engaged in whatever platform it is, all these problems might become less. There is no reason in the world why these companies should be allowed to do whatever profits them the most. And Designing their recommendation engines to suit their desires is not what we have understood freedom of expression to mean. It's not really expression of anything. It's freedom of manipulation. Freedom of engineering people's brains to be ideal victims. Maybe that's something society needs to prohibit. Maybe the kinds of censorship that intrude in areas that are, in some sense, expression of views and ideas will not do so 
Well, harm we're scared of if these platforms can't magnify their influence by making people addicted. I think it's worth a try. So, at this point, I guess it's time for me to ask the questions. Hello. 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 This microphone doesn't have the problem. That's okay. Hello. It works. Hello. Um, hi, Richard. This is my first time attending Free Software Foundation event. And I just want to know um, how fast I'll be. Please speak slowly. Yes. Okay, of course. Please just let me explain that. There's three things you need to do for me. One is to speak loud while well, you're doing that. The next one is to speak slower, and the next thing is to pronounce each consonant carefully, the way I'm doing now. And that will help you stay slow. And that will make it possible to recognize the sounds you're saying. That's where my problem is. And there's no remedy I have. Um, it's up to you. Should I just stand up to make um, the sound propagate properly into the air? <laughs> um, uh, you're doing that. That's not it. It's good to pronounce them carefully. What do you say? What does that mean? Write another word. That doesn't work. Okay. Because of my limits. Okay. Um, as I could see, you have done a lot of work in um, free software movement, and I saw an organization, a non-profit organization, earlier before FSF. Um, they have a similar mission, which is to promote the anonymity in the internet. This organization is the um, I wouldn't say competition organization, but it's like what's the name of it? MIT, and there have um, this Sloan Foundation supporting the Tor network. So I am just wondering how you would compare yourself. It's not that kind of compare, but just as a analysis, a comparison. Um, between FSF and Tor Network, Tor Project. It's also a non-profit. Power okay. by this yeah. Sloan. And I'm having a problem with MIT right now. Is this it an M or is it an N? Mine or November? Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Oh. So they have this Sloan Foundation um, supporting Tor Project. And I wonder, if you know, if you have enough knowledge about it, and what would you say about their organization? Well, first of all, the Tor network is a good thing, and I use it. I strongly defend the right to be anonymous on the internet, because if you're fooling yourself, if you think you have some sort of privacy, once your personal data has been collected, the, once a database of personal data has been collected, it will be disused. So the European Union's orientation towards, quote, data protection, unquote, is misguided. The uh, GDPR of the European Union, which is supposed to protect privacy, it's a good attempt, but it is terribly flawed. It emphasizes more limiting how databases can be used than pre preventing them from being collected in the first place. Europe seems to be full of parking lots where 
everyone who parks is required to enter her uh, car's license plate number to get as a way of paying for parking. Well, that's, a, that's tracking everyone. That's oppression. Uh, if the GDPR doesn't prohibit that, it's inadequate. So Tor is good because it enables you to connect to an internet site and your ISP can't tell what site you're talking to and the site you're talking to can't tell where you are. So I install almost all the time. So I would say that what they're doing and what we are doing are complementary. There are a lot of things that need to be done to defend freedom in the world. And it's good that there are many organizations working on these different things. But you also need free software. If you're running a non-free program, it's very likely to be spying on you. And if it's running on your computer, well, even if you're talking with the world over the Tor network, the, pro the malware program on your computer can collect data about you and send it wherever it likes. Thank you for your explanation. And of course, I would also point out that this event is organized by GNUNET and V, which is GNU's approach to building a better internet with privacy. Uh, that is a bit broader than Tor. We don't replace Tor, still use Tor. But there is also, of course, GNUNET as part of GNU to help with this. Now, Thank you very much. Um, in my view, in my perception, all these different crises which we are living through something in common, and that's um, protection rackets. And so I feel if a movement for freedom, like a free, free software movement, can contribute something which is absolutely key, is, is to fight these protection rackets. Well, yes. Free so what, what do you think can be done in this movement to free fight software. these protection rackets? Free Thank you very much. Free software is exactly an attempt to stop the software protection racket. It's software that doesn't try to be protected from your being able to use it. Because you're free to use it. Uh, you can share it with others, redistribute it, and adapt it to your needs. So, it's not being artificially restricted to stop you from getting at it or doing with it what you want to do. So you might call it the quintessential rejection of these protection rackets. Of course, there are other areas of life where protection rackets are operating, uh, and some of them need to be fought separately. Uh, I also stated views about copyright. And you can find that in gnu.org slash philosophy slash copyright vs community.html. It's the transcript of the talk by that title. And after explaining the history of copyright and how it changed from uh, protecting and defending authors against publishers into a way for publishers to restrict readers and therefore became unjust. I recommend some changes. First, I divide works into works that you use in a practical way versus work, works of opinion, art, and so on. If the work is used to do something practical, it should be free. People should be free to redistribute copies, modify it. So if you've got a recipe, you should be free to change the recipe and publish your version and, of course, share the recipe with others. If it's a program, you should be free to publish your modified version and share the program with others. Likewise, for anything else that 
whose purpose is that it helps people do a practical job. But if it's our opinion, anything like that, that argument doesn't apply. That's not, those are not practical jobs. There are other kinds of value. They are value in society, but not practical value. So I think it's OK to have a copyright system. But it shouldn't last too long. I suggested no more than 10 years after the work is published. And even during that time, people should be free to non-commercially redistribute exact copies. So copyright should not get in the way of sharing. And when I use the word sharing, it means non-commercial redistribution of exact copies. Free software permits a lot more than sharing. You can even commercially publish a modified version of a free program. But that's because software is a, a work that is meant to do practical jobs for people. Anyway, that's, that's how I pack that particular protection racket. And you'll notice that the copyright war is shooting up again. Uh, there are people who don't like chat GPT. I'm not, and, well, I have my own reasons for not liking it. It's a bullshit generator. They have other, like, they're authors who seem to think that there's something wrong if a program analyzes uh, their works and figures out their styles and can write in a similar style. But you know, this is something that human beings have done for ages. And this was never considered copyright infringement before. But they want it to be taken as copyright infringement. And they're trying to use their personal mystique, their personal prestige to distort the law. And of course, they're using all the propaganda words like theft, all the usual propaganda words that are used whenever somebody is trying to make copyright more restrictive than it needs to be. So we better be ready to fight that. I don't think it is wrong for a program to analyze the style of a work, even though that requires looking through the text of the work. People, people have done that for ages. It was considered lawful. It should be lawful now. And it should be lawful when programs do it, just as it's lawful when humans do it. So uh, we better get organized now before they make it a crime to analyze the style of the work. And if you want to go into the field of uh, literary criticism, tough on you, it's going to be considered copyright infringement. Hello. Uh, I, I, I'm having trouble hearing you right now. Okay. You speak more clearly. Okay. About the Red Hat situation you called earlier, do you think it's time for a musical license? Or I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that last part. Do I think it's time for the what license? For a new CPL license to protect a movement or some things? I don't think that would help. And the reason is we have so much software that's already published under various free licenses and relicense, you know. Changing the license of those programs would be very difficult to do in practice. And then Red Hat might just use the old versions, which are under the existing licenses. So that doesn't look like it is a solution. Yes. And I have the, the following question. We have a proprietorship problem in software manufacturing and licensing. Then we have a huge sector of GMO proprietorship and licensing. Do you see any parallels and which ones? Well, uh, I see some parallel. There's some similarity, but 
Biology and software are very different fields. A lot of people have been quick to jump to the conclusion that biology is like programming. I think that they don't know what they're talking about. But it, and GMOs raise different kinds of issues also. And they're typically monopolized by patents. Not, they're not copyrightable at all. Copyright law and patent law are different on every point. They have almost nothing in common. If you generalize about patent law and copyright law, you're already wrong. You're already going down the wrong tree. So forget it. Don't try to generalize them. Look at each one as what it is. And don't ever try to assume this, that you should <coughs> see them as a single thing. That kind of generalization is a mistake. What you find is that <coughs> there are various strange, outrageous things that happen with patented genes in organisms. For instance, if pollen drifts onto another farmer's field, and as a result, that farmer's crop has a patented gene in it, uh, in the US, I think that, far that farmer is just liable for patent infringement. Now, in Canada, I think the, there was an outcome different from that, which was that uh, the liability of that farmer for patent infringement was blamed on whoever the pollen blew from. That's a little more just, I suppose. But uh, there should be patents on organisms for growing food because uh, we've got to make sure patent farmers are free to grow the things they want to grow and to read the things they're growing. That is the freedom that farmers have had for thousands of years, and it should not be taken away. Taking it away gives big companies more power over farmers. And the general thing that's wrong with our society is that big companies have too much power over everybody. So we shouldn't add to that. Uh, a question. Uh, given most of people are doing their computing nowadays... I, I don't hear you, I'm sorry. Can sorry. You speak more clearly? Yes. Given more, uh, most of people are doing their computing nowadays using smartphones, uh, should we shift uh, more of our focus as a, as a group uh, towards uh, smartphones instead of working on a Unix-like operating system? Or what is your vision uh, on that? That's easier. What you suggested could be a very good thing to do if it were possible. But it's, it sounds easy, but in practice it's almost impossible. But those devices are designed so we can't replace their operating systems. So we don't really have the, op the option of doing that. And then what makes them interesting to their users is that they have thousands of apps, which are all non-free, essentially. It, with Android, there are a few exceptions. There are some free apps that can be run on it. And they do some generally useful things. But there are the still, there's still the thousands of apps released for various organizations to talk to them. And there's no way we can replace them with free apps to talk to those organizations. So basically, there's no way to liberate the world of these non-free apps. We had a somewhat of an idea for that. 
it didn't work on apps, it worked on websites. And the idea was to enable the community to develop replacement JavaScript code that would be free, that would enable you to talk to a website, and not, and a website that normally requires you to run non-free JavaScript code, but with the help of this community platform, we would have ways to talk to many sites, replacing the non-free JavaScript, and this could liberate some of the jobs that people, well, in this case, they'd be doing them with websites, but they're the same jobs that people might do on their snoop phones with apps. Uh, well, it got started, but one of the two main people disappeared, and the one main one could make a go of it alone. But if anyone's interested in this, Get in touch with me. You know, if you've got enough drive to do this, maybe you can pick it up again. So, if you think we cannot find this model, what should our strategy be? Well, I don't understand the question. My attitude towards snoop phones is they're malicious devices, so I won't use it. I don't have one. If you want to be free, that's you need to do that. It's either that or not. Now, uh, we might wish that we could somehow liberate the world of snoop phones. But I think it's, you know, so what should our strategy be? I think it's the wrong question. There's an assumption in that question that our reaction should be, or response should be, a strategy. But you'll notice my response is not a strategy. It's simply saying no to something that would mistreat me. And that question has an answer, you see. The strategy question, I don't see how we can find an answer. There are giant companies making sure that we can't unlock the nasty products that they make. Um, here's a me with a little story. Uh, I can't understand you, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, question in the form of story. So sometimes I do a drawing, it can be a, is a technical drawing or an artistic one, and I'd like to share the drawing uh, uh, preferably under some free terms, uh, because I want others to be able to adjust this drawing to their likings and share it further. Uh, the problem that I face is that sometimes I draw a two or a part in a free CAD, and then someone else uses something like SolidWorks or Autodesk, and it does share the work. But I cannot do anything with it without signing a contract with Autodesk or SolidWorks company, and so others can't. And sometimes I draw some nice picture in Krita, and then someone else takes this picture and adjusts this using Adobe Photoshop and shares that, and now you have to either pay Adobe, Adobe tax, or you can okay, okay, I start. I think I get the point. And it's a, an important, it's a significant point. But because I've never done anything with any of those programs, I need to ask you a question so I can understand it properly. So, do these programs, these non-free programs you're talking about, do they offer any kind of export into a format that is documented that free programs can implement? Some of them do, but uh, it's uh, very uh, non-functional. Uh, for example, in Adobe Photoshop, you cannot uh, meaningfully export layer information, but it does understand the uh, Krita and TIFF format, but it I'm doesn't sorry, let you say it back. 
it does understand something or other I couldn't make sense of. Yeah. Uh, it can import layer information from free software, but it refuses to export it back. Ah. And I believe that was done intentionally because there was nothing preventing Adobe from implementing yeah. that. And yeah, the I thing is I don't like that. And I propose we issue something like you do document license. So well, we'll actually, just forbidden. It's easier. That is, it's easy to say, but well, what that license should actually require is that very difficult question. There's no, I don't see a simple answer. Now, maybe there is an okay answer that I don't see. But I wonder this. You explained that uh, Photoshop can't output a drawing with layer information in a format for free software. But I wonder, can you selectively output one layer at a time? Uh, you can output layer by layer, but there's also sometimes layer metadata, like for example, relationship between layers, because a layer can be not just a drawing, but a filter. For example, you use one layer as a picture, and another black and white layer as a lighting adjustment. Um, Adobe cannot export that in a way that you can easily use it. So it well, will be a long castle at least. An idea first, I don't know if this will work. I've never used that program at all, or any other for that job. But maybe with a little bit of continuation of this kind of approach, you could manage to output these various kinds of information separately in such a way that another free program could read them all in and put them together. It might be some work, but it might be doable. It might be a way of solving this problem technically. Yeah, I know, but the point is that's not a totally effective thing. If something like this works, Adobe's power will be somewhat reduced. And sure, Adobe will do another nasty thing, but you're being perhaps too perfectionist. If we can't solve the whole problem for good and all forever, that doesn't mean it's useless. Okay. Well, thank you, Richard. Uh, he will be around, but a bit difficult. Actually, to now it's fine. Oh, what a Right, auction. Sorry. Where is, where is that? Where is my red band? Where is my red You can get your money out. It's also very hard. It's one to one, right? No, 
though patterns are actually worth somewhat more, it would be a complicated thing. Uh, Let's have the bidding in dollars, francs, euros, because that way it'll simplify things. Uh, when you bid, please wave your arm and shout the amount you're bidding as loud as you can, because you want me to hear you, right? 150. Okay, I've got 150 dollars, pounds, euros. Do I get 175? Why not Bitcoin? I don't hear what that person said. It wasn't loud enough. They wanted a Bitcoin. No, uh, well, you know... Freedom. It's about freedom, right, isn't it? No, we don't have to accept Bitcoin. <laughs> Uh, and basically, this dividing it up, I can't do that with Bitcoin. I, I'm afraid that that's just not feasible. Uh, do I get 175 for this adorable? Are you saying 175 over there? Okay, you need to shout louder, but I think I heard. Okay, so you're bidding 175. Okay, do I get 200 for this adorable canoe that needs a call? 200. What? 200. I'm sorry, I don't hear you. 200. 200. Okay, you're bidding 200. I got 200. Do I get 225? <laughs> 225 to the Free Software Foundation and the GNUnet Foundation. To do, oh, sorry, what? 225, okay. Uh, do I get 250? Do I get 250 for the support? Yes. How much? Yes. Are you bidding? I'm sorry, I don't hear you. Are you bidding? Yes, I am. How much do you bid? 250 money units. Okay. I'm, 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 Seventy-five or more to the Free Software Foundation and the Unit Foundation. Okay, I've got three hundred dollars, uh, euros or francs. Do I get three fifty? How much you bid? Three fifty. I've got three fifty. Do I get four hundred? Do I get four hundred for this adorable? which I would sign if you wish. Okay, 400. I've got 400. Do I get 450 for this adorable blue? 450 to the Free Software Foundation and Dominion Foundation. Last chance to bid 450 or more for this adorable blue. Last chance. How much? You don't accept credit cards. I can't hear you. Do you accept credit cards? Uh, that may be complicated. Uh, Zoe, is that feasible here? Yeah, you can. Oh, yeah, we can. Okay, 500. I've got 500. Okay, 500 for this adorable video. Do I get 550? Last chance to bid 550 or more for this adorable canoe. Okay, 550. Okay, I've got 550. Do I get 600? This may be a record, although I don't remember. <laughs> what? I, I'm sorry, I don't hear those it's words. It's because of new 40. Anyway, so I've got 550. Do I get 600? Last chance to get 600 or more. Going. Going. Okay, 600. Okay, I've got 600. Do I get 650? Last chance to get 650 or more. For this adorable blue, do I get 650? 650 or more? Going. Going. You said something. What did you say? 650? Are you bidding 650? 
650? Okay, I've got 650. Now do I get 700 for this adorable widow? Do I get 700 for this adorable widow? Last chance to get 700 or more. Going, going, gone for 650.
He has no master. Who is that unmad man? Thank you. 